Friends, our scripture reading this day is from the Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 14 to 21. As we prepare, let us pray. God of goodness and hope, in this scripture we find your faithfulness. Be with us now and write your words on our hearts that they would stay as near to us as our next breaths. Fill us with your life. Amen. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. This episode in Luke's gospel happens near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He has been on the road, going from place to place, teaching and preaching along the way, and gaining a reputation as an insightful teacher. As he comes to his hometown of Nazareth, he arrives as something of an honored guest. He goes to the synagogue, as was his custom, Luke says, where all eyes are upon him. Indeed, there is a sense that this is the moment everyone has been waiting for, The time is at hand, and Jesus is about to reveal who he is, what he will do, and for whom he has come. When the time comes for the reading of scripture, Jesus stands up and is handed a scroll. It's the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and as he unrolls it, it's clear he already knows which passage he will read. He passes through the opening words through the middle part of Isaiah's words of comfort, rolling, rolling, until he gets almost to the end, chapter 61, where he begins, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He continues with verses that go on to say there's good news for the poor and for every person who is bound up or pressed down or broken in spirit, the impoverished, the imprisoned, and everyone who is hungry for something new and saving. It's a powerful passage. It ends with a potent reference to the year of God's favor, a notion that rings with the promise of the Jubilee year, the dream of a time when all debts are canceled and all divisions are overcome and prisoners are set free. It's a promised day when everyone gets a new beginning. After he has finished the reading, Jesus hands the scroll back to the attendant, and everyone is waiting for what will happen next. Jesus sits down to interpret the reading, as any good rabbi would do, but what he says next astonishes the congregation. Today, 
this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, he says. Today, in other words, this script is being enacted. It is being brought to life in a new way. The Spirit is upon me, a word which once referred to the ancient prophet Isaiah, is being brought forward in time. And Jesus is now claiming it for himself. It's as if he's saying, this Spirit, it's alive, and it's on the move, and it has come near. It is right here, right now. And more, Jesus is saying, that mission of bringing good news I am making it my own because there are still so many who need to receive it here and now, who need to know that old wounds can be healed and broken relationships repaired and that God's love has the power to bring new life from all that is dying and dead in us and in the world. In echoing the words of the ancient prophet, the Spirit is upon me. Jesus is putting on a mantle, a garment, an identity. He steps into an old role in a new context, reactivating the promise of the Jubilee year, opening himself to be filled with it, filled up, fulfilling it. The promise found in this piece of scripture becomes the script for an unfolding drama and a way of life. The words of the text don't just sit there on the page. They also aren't just spoken out loud. Jesus will live them out loud. It's what his whole ministry will be about. That and inviting us to join him on the journey, bringing it forward again to our time, right here, right now, since the presence of Jesus continues with us and in the church to this very day. The drawing near of the kingdom of God is a promise of good news we still need to hear, isn't it? It's a dream to fill our imaginations, a calling to listen for, a script to act out, out, a garment to step into, a promised day to watch for, a beloved community to build. In the words of our theme for this season, it's a light to live. We get glimpses of that light, times when that calling seems so bright and clear, when the Spirit fills us with a holy energy that propels us forward to seek the good, to extend every kindness, and to persevere, never giving up, trusting that there is still hope for us, that we can still become the people and the world God's love wants us to be. Faith lives there, in that hope, in those glimpses, in that light, and in our longing for a better, fairer, more loving, and peaceful world. And in the witness, we feel called to shine through our commitments to justice. Laura Riyamaki has something to say about all of that. She is the chair of our Board of Missions and Christian Social Action and the leader of our social justice emphasis, the one we discerned as one of our church's current priorities. Laura. on? Can you hear me okay? Good. I do have something to say, Chris, and you know, the, always the real trouble is figuring out what not to say, because I got a lot to say. Um, 
And I'm, I'm going to take the liberty, since she gave me the fancy microphone, to um, tell you where I just came from. Um, I, I flew in from um, New Mexico because I was at the Queer Christian Fellowship Conference over the last three days. And I've got to tell you, I'm fired up. So I'm going to do my best to stay to my text here, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fired up. <laughs> There's something about doing church um, with a bunch of queer folks who have been kicked out of church and have chosen to come back anyway and still share the good news that is incredibly powerful. So Chris just talked about Jesus introducing his ministry as bringing good news in the face of poverty and oppression. Drawing on a tradition of God declaring justice and renewal to the people and to the land. We live in a different time than Jesus did, and yet I think our calling is the same. Jesus proclaimed and embodied light and good news in a time of darkness and oppression by the Roman Empire. In our place and time, what does darkness look like to us? I'm gonna pause it. It looks like mass shootings, even in our backyard. A climate crisis that is burning our homes and filling our skies with smoke, with threats of worse for future generations. A legacy of racism that continues to dehumanize people of color with heartbreaking consequences. A rise of anti-LGBTQ legislation pushing back against newly won freedoms. And the weight of all that heartbreak isolation and loneliness, causing an epidemic of mental health challenges for our children and all of us. Sometimes that darkness feels really strong. But here's the thing. If you take a step back and think about the things that I just listed, they are problems of our own making. Mass shootings, climate change, racism, Marginalizing those who are different from us, isolation and loneliness, those are problems that people created. And if that is the case, then shouldn't it also be in our power to create a better path forward? Catherine Wilkinson, one of the editors of the book, All We Can Save, says that the climate crisis is a leadership crisis. I'm here this morning those aren't empty words. I'm here this morning. I got up at 3.30 to get here this morning because I believe that the leadership of First Congregational Church matters. I believe that we have a faith and a light that is relevant and strong enough to chase away the darkness around us. So what does it look like for us to live out our faith in a way that's stronger than the darkness in our community. I hope that you are ready to dream with me about the answer to that question. On the pilgrimage in Alabama, I learned how deeply faith was integrated into the civil rights movement. It was religious music that fueled their perseverance. It was a theology of nonviolence in response to brutality that caught the nation's attention it was an embodiment of the Sermon on the Mount. It was the church congregations that formed the basis of their networking. I think as people of faith, we have a lot of unique leadership to bring. Spiritual practices, trust in God's abundance that can help us build strength of character so that we choose to respond in love instead of fear, humility instead of domination, and compassion instead of greed. We have stories that radically define all human beings as deeply valuable. We have a tradition of repentance and forgiveness and moving forward even when we have failed in the past. We have the example of the life of Jesus and the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. And these are all things that I am looking forward to exploring with you as we move forward with a strategic plan, seeking to live the light in new ways. Today, in talking about the work we have done over the past year, and what I hope will continue to be a focus 
of the work in the years ahead of us, I want to highlight one strength that we bring to the work. Community. I think we already know as a congregation how vital community is to support each other in joy and hard times. And we have seen the power that comes when our church community responds to the needs around us by pooling our time and our resources. This church responds generously to things like food drives, soup kitchen, special offerings, buying the Burbanks a new truck. And as we continue to explore what it means to be a people of social justice, a people who speak good news to the oppressed, I believe that our strength of community can also be applied to living the light in advocating for more just systems. Benjamin Todd Jealous said that in a democracy there are only two types of power. There's organized people and organized money. And organized money only wins when people aren't organized. I believe that organizing, working together, is the key to solving the problems of our own making. Our social justice ministries, racial justice ministry, the climate action team, the gun violence Pre prevention ministry, the mental health ministry, and the LGBTQ plus group have all formed from the passion of people in the church to address needs and injustices in the community around us. They are grassroots efforts led by dedicated and energetic folks. And in our church's strategic plan, we determined that one of the strategies that we want to use to live out our faith is to integrate our social justice ministries more deeply into the life of the congregation. So this year, in addition to the solid work that these groups have already been doing, we have started meeting quarterly as a coalition. The social justice ministries join with the Board of Missions and Christian Social Action quarterly to explore how we can amplify and integrate our work collaboratively, both inside the church and with our community partners. From those meetings, we have started to develop joint actions, including a multi-group get out the vote effort with our partner Together Colorado. There was a connection between the Climate Action Team and NAACP's Environmental Justice Committee, uh, and a group consensus on how to discern involvement in advocacy projects. Personally, I was particularly proud of canvassing for the first time in the get out the vote efforts. For a person who was too shy to call and order a pizza in college, knocking on doors is not the most appealing activity. <laughs> but with support from Oscar, Oscar at Together Colorado and some good on the ground coaching from Caitlin Smith, I got a lot more comfortable with it over the course of the afternoon. There was a group of 12 or so from our congregation who participated in canvassing and literature drop efforts and we covered a fair bit of ground in student neighborhoods. It felt empowering to make my small contribution to what I knew were the efforts of many people and groups within our community. Efforts that were re rewarded by a higher student voter turnout in Boulder in 2023 than in 2021. As a church, we have also put our money where our mouth is, giving each ministry $5,000 to spend on their work with community partners and educating the congregation. This has supported partnerships with groups like the NAACP, Out Boulder, and Mindful Works. It has also supported member participation in regional UCC um, events on climate justice, the pilgrimage to Alabama, and a community gun buyback event. And we're just getting started. I didn't give you the full list of what happened last year, but those are some highlights. And in the coming years, I look forward to continuing to deepen the conversation with you all about what living the good news looks like in the face of the darkness around us, and continuing to build networks and relationships inside and outside of the church to organize and advocate for more just systems. So the, the song we're gonna sing next is This Little Light of Mine. And I didn't know before I went on the pilgrimage to Alabama that this was a really central song to the civil rights movement. And it brings a deeper meaning for me to a song that I've been singing since I could talk, right? Um, the idea that this light that we have to bring is relevant to the real stuff going on around us. And it's a reminder that when we come together, we can really make an impact on our community. So thank you. 